It is the test on us, whether we are part of it or on the side. The worst enemies of Islam, it's the Muslims. It's the way we behave, the way we react. And these media look for that opportunity to exploit it and say, well, these are the Muslims behaving. And if we remain on the side, thinking that others will do the work, and we will be free from it, then we are living in a mistaken world. Our speaker is Sir Iqbal Sakraini. So Iqbal Sakraini was born in Malawi and arrived in the United Kingdom for further studies in 1969. He is a fellow of the Institute of Financial Accountants in the UK and an associate of the Institute of Administrative Management in the UK. He was re-elected the Secretary General of the Muslim Council of Britain, a national umbrella and representative body of British Muslims in 2004 and he completed his four-year term in June 2006. He was the founding Secretary General when the MCB was established in 1997. He is also a member of International Advisory Panel of the World Islamic Economic Forum. In May 2008, Sir Iqbal was elected Chairman of Muslim Aid, an international relief agency. He has served on the advisory council of four home secretaries, advising the British government on matters relating to equality and race relations. Sir Iqbal has over the years served on a number of charitable and community organizations, including the British Heart Foundation and the National Coordinating Committee of the European Year Against Racism in the UK. He was honored with the British knighthood by the Queen in 2005. So we welcome to the stage Sir Iqbal Sokraini. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Nahmudu wa nasalli ala Rasulil Karim. My respected ulama ikram, distinguished scholars, elders, brothers and sisters, friends, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm grateful to our Creator, God Almighty, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to be amongst you this, with this illustrious gathering and an important conference which is so crucial in terms of bringing understanding in the world community which everyone thrives for. And this is the issue of peace, the solution for the humanity. I'm also grateful to the Islamic Research Foundation and Dr. Zaki Naik for inviting me and being part of this August gathering where we have an opportunity to share our views and express our thoughts on issues that concerns all of us. Over the last few days, you've had the opportunity to listen to some of the key and very important scholars who have arrived from different parts of the world and who have spoken, I'm sure eloquently, on different topics covering the theme of the conference, the peace, the solution for humanity. And I'm sure that during their deliberations, they have very profoundly expressed their views in relation to the teachings of the Holy Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, giving a very clear message of the position of Islam and its role in bringing peace around the world. Today, I will be sharing with you my 
thoughts, my experiences on the key issue of civility in communication. This is in direct relation to the theme of my talk, which is sacrilege, vilification is not acceptable in a civilized society. First of all, let us try and understand what do we mean by the word sacrilege or vilification. In its simplest form, it is a violation of one's deepest religious sanctities. It's a denigration of the values which you hold so deeply and so sacred. And in the centuries ago, in the Christian era, the word blasphemy was used, which directly reflected to denigration of the Christian faith. However, the word blasphemy also applies to other faith. But we prefer to use the word sacrilege or vilification as it is more wider in its usage. Today, we hope that we are living in a civilized societies around the world. So what are the key ingredients of a civilized society? Well, we don't have to be rocket scientists to understand that the key concepts of mutual respect, mutual understanding, mutual affection and love for each other, and to try and hear the other side, important and essential ingredients of a civilized society. So, and for it to be applied, it works both ways. We do not expect everyone else to respect myself or ourselves, and for us to ignore who the others are, and to ignore their views as well. This now leads me to highlighting some of my major experiences that started nearly 20 years ago in October 1988 with the publication of the sacrilegious book, The Satanic Verses. Many of you in the audience that I see were perhaps not present at that time. They were not born. Or some of you may have been very young. But suddenly time has gone by. But the message that had come out from that very sad and evil actions that had come about with the publication of that book reverberates today and its consequences are felt in many parts of the world. For it is not just that publication that caused so much of furor and concern around the world. But perhaps it also ignited many other instances very similar, which basically in simple terms were attack on Islam and Muslim identity. But why do we give so much of importance to this subject? For it is very clear that in the past, in the Judeo-Christian era, these strongly held religious views were also respected and were protected by themselves very strongly. But through the time and ages, they suddenly disappeared. So today, it seems to be of no concern when they are prepared to use the language, use the images that attack Isa alayhi salam, or for that matter, other prophets. Because for them, it seems to be something of a right in a civilized society, freedom to express, freedom of speech, freedom to say what you want to, irrespective of its consequences or whatever. But as far as Muslims are concerned, this is an issue which we cannot take it lightly. Because there are clear lines of boundaries that have been set.
let's come under the shade of the scholars. So the issue is a problem of knowledge. Asim Al-Hakim. Why do people do bid'ah? Imam Malik said, whoever claims there is a good innovation in the deen. Salim Al-Amri. He is accusing that Prophet Muhammad did not convey the message. Dr. Mamduh Muhammad. If you know that the Prophet Sallallahu did something and I do something else, you have to follow the Prophet Sallallahu Don't follow me. Abdul Rahim Makati. But if each one believes his goal is to please Allah, to follow the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abdul Rahim Green. I think this really is to do with your internal state. Where does the Quran and Sunnah point to? Muhammad Al Sharif. They have to follow what Allah and His Messenger said. Let's imbibe from these scholars the fruitful solutions for the problems of the world. Which one we would take and which one we would leave? Question to every Muslim. To every Muslim. In the shade of the scholars, every Wednesday and Friday at 11.30 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 12.30 a.m. UAE on Peace TV. Values to adopt. The most important thing in our deen is aqidah. Teachings to implement. Second to that is morals. Principles to pursue. There are several reasons why do kids lie. Here to execute the doctrines of Islam to make every move successful. A visitor at home today at 3.30 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 4.30 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. Where truth is hidden. Misleading quotations create confusion. Where truth is hidden, lack of knowledge and wisdom cause upheaval and commotion. Where truth is hidden, manipulated scriptures and twisted facts emerge. This very hidden truth creates false propaganda, mayhem, chaos, disorder, and turmoil in our lives and the world order. But is there anyone with courage and wisdom? What is the truth? And who has the courage to expose it? Because it's your right to know the truth. Watch Truth Prevail and Lies Perish in Truth Exposed by Dr. Zakir Naik. Next on Peace TV. Islam is no problem. There are hundreds and thousands of books that are today in many libraries around the world, critical of Islam. Many of the Islamic scholars have written books that are critical on certain aspects of the teaching of Islam. But as far as the central value is concerned, the personality of the Prophet وسلم, which is central to our faith, remains very clear there's an issue in the arabic term called shatamun nabi where such denigration violent the personality of prophet وسلم, has to be dealt in an extremely serious manner the islamic laws and jurisdiction that applies to such actions or such crime that takes place but those laws are applicable a way there is Muslim jurisdiction or Islamic law. Let us also not forget that this issue of sacrilege or vilification is not a new phenomena that has suddenly come in in the 19th or the 20th century. Even during the time of Prophet Muslim, there were incidents that took place and when they did take place there were clear-cut measures and laws that dealt with it. The difficulty which we face today, and I'm not really concerned about in Muslim countries where there's a Muslim law, but where the large sections of the Muslim community in the world reside in non-Muslim countries, in Europe, in the States, and in many other parts of the world where Muslims are in minority. So let me just go through some of the examples of such vile attacks that had taken place 
how the community reacted and what was the end result. Because this will explain the position in terms of where we stand today. And it's not something that's going to disappear tomorrow or in years to come. As long as Islam grows and it's becoming a substantive faith for many people around the world, the challenges that we face in terms of attacks on Islam, for whatever reason, we have to live with it. And the best way of dealing with it is through your experiences of the past, how you handled it. Learn from those experiences, and then we are better prepared when we face in the future. This book, The Satanic Verses, caused so much of misunderstanding and hostility against Islam that I think no other book in the contemporary times had done so much damage. What should have been seen as a simple issue of blasphemy and profanity was turned into a clash between Muslim and Western liberal culture. What should have been seen as a genuine Muslim reaction of anger and protest was misdirected to issues of freedom of expression and censorship. This was a classic case where the media took this great opportunity as an irresponsible manner to turn the victims into criminals, the oppressed into the oppressors, and the innocent into guilty. We ourselves had to fight against a brick wall, explaining the very basic reason why we are saying sacrilege is not acceptable. It was not heard. You could not take to because, of course, we are living in the UK in a liberal, secular, democratic society where everybody has free to express their views. But when it comes to defending your views or trying to project a view that is different to the forces that are in power, then your views, as much as you live in a democratic society and you can cry for the freedom of expression, your freedom of expression is curtailed. This was the tragedy that we had faced. We are well, well aware that Islam has neither advocated the suppression of freedom of expression, nor encouraged censorship of healthy and useful material. This was the book that not only abused the Quran, the Prophet ﷺ and his companions, his wives, but also the Prophet Ibrahim والسلام, the patriarch common to Islam, Christianity and Judaism, but also the Hindus, the Sikhs, and in so doing, they did not spare the Queen of England as well in attacking her. And of course, the British Prime Minister was attacked, and generally all the white women were attacked in a very abusive manner. The message that was supposed to come out was that Quran, the holy book of Islam, is not immune from external manipulation and interpolation as God has proclaimed, but that it was influenced and manipulated by Satan. Some people have commented, and some commentators from both the Muslim world and non-Muslim world spoke very openly about it, that the Rushdie's book was like a knife being dug into you. In a similar way, where someone mentioned that where one is being wrapped, he further elaborated by saying that what Rushdie has written is far worse for Muslims than if he's wrapped one's own daughter. And we are all clear in our mind that those who are closest to us, our parents, our children, 
when they get abused, we find it unacceptable. We react to it very naturally. But there is an added responsibility as Muslims. And the Holy Quran mentioned that whosoever is an enemy to Allah and his angels and prophets, to Jibrail and Mikhail, Allah is an enemy to those who reject faith. In other places, it's been mentioned, those who annoy Allah and his messenger, Allah has cursed them in the world and in the hereafter and has prepared for them a humiliating punishment. This is the clear teaching. This is not an issue of choice, whether we can feel emotional or not. It is natural. When you see your child falling down, you don't need to try to understand what to do. There's a natural reaction. Issue is when your faith is being vilified, when your founders of the faith are being denigrated, how do we react? And this is the test which is so crucial in terms of the success of what we want to achieve or not. The love of the Prophet is ingrained so deeply and indelibly on a Muslim that any disrespect to him is unacceptable, is unimaginable. And any Muslim would be proud to sacrifice his life, his precious possessions, and all that he has in defending the Prophet's honor should it be demanded to him. Indeed, in one of the traditions of the Holy Prophet the perfection of faith has been made conditional to your love of the Prophet, which takes precedence over the love of one's own parents and even on one's own self. What one we need to understand, that seems to be a clear position where we have got no ifs and buts. But the media that picks up some of this information is it sheer ignorance or is it all deliberate and with malicious intent of course they are aware that it's very hurtful when media projects such negative effect such negative messages about islam but what is interesting for us to note that Sometimes they draw this information from the perceptions and the resource files of the experts who are the Orientalists, the Islamologists, who over the years have been in business to denigrate Islam and attack Islam in every possibility. But also, how can a non-Muslim journalist or writer be expected to respect Islam or Muslim sensitivities when he or she finds Muslims themselves showing a great lack of self-respect. Who are the worst enemies of Islam? It's the Muslims. It's the way we behave, the way we react. And this media look for that opportunity to exploit it and say, well, these are the Muslims behaving. When this campaign was conducted in the UK in 1988 after the publication of this book, it is a unique time in the history of Muslims in Britain where the diverse section of the Muslim community, so with different uh, you know, people of school of thought, different traditions, but we know for a fact that those who follow the Quran and the Soon of the Prophet happens to be the right group. However, all these groups were invited to come together. And it was indeed a unique experience seeing all these different groups, heads of the groups, community leaders, activists, all getting together on the table, discussing one simple aspect of the work. How do we go about in ensuring that sacrilege is not acceptable. It was no easy task. But this is the beauty of Islam. That where there is sincerity, 
where the intention is clear, Allah's help comes in mysterious ways. That campaign, Alhamdulillah, brought together this wide range of groups, brought their hearts together, and they realized that in unity lies our strength. And it was that unity that brought together a very dignified, calculated campaign against the book. The ambassadors, the ambassadors of peace, of peace from, from different parts of